Good day, my name is Imke Lüders. I'm a veterinarian from Germany and I work with Zoo and Wildlife for the last 10 years. My specialty is reproduction of endangered large mammals. And uh, today we are here at the Alvetta Zoo Münster, where I also do some practical work. Well, when we, when we talk about um, conservation of species, one important factor is, of course, that the animals breed and reproduce. And um, besides the populations that are in the wild, we call them the in-situ populations, we also have ex-situ populations. These are the animals that are kept in zoos that are generally in captivity. And um, in order to reproduce those captive uh, populations, um, the uh, natural breeding is of course important, but in some instances, um, for example, males are not willing to mate, or the male is away in a different zoo. Um, we also use the tool of uh, so-called assisted reproduction and these assisted reproduction technologies comprise of a very wide uh, variety of tools that we have. It starts with assessing the animal with ultrasound, um, it starts with uh, semen collection of, of males and, and then it goes further to more advanced techniques such as artificial insemination, embryo transfer, in vitro uh, embryo production, um, these are all the really sophisticated tools and these tools can be used to promote a species, to promote the reproduction of a species if there is no natural mating or if the mating partners are not close together. So um, it has been postulated for a long time that the assisted reproduction techniques should be more implemented for conservation and for reproduction of animals and also for the genetic conservation of certain individuals, um, but yet uh, in, in wildlife conservation it has been kind of used only as a side tool, not really as, as uh, it's not really as researched yet as it should be. It has been used occasionally in large mammals, um, elephants are a good example, we had many uh, births through artificial insemination in elephants, uh, in rhinos we started, uh, in felines we have some, some good results already. Um, but it, it isn't as much used as it, as it is, for example, in domestic animals or humans. So here the techniques have been studied for much longer time and much more intensive because domestic animals are easier to handle and there's a big commercial interest. And in uh, our wildlife uh, there's basically no financial background and it's very difficult to, um, to access these animals. And these are some of the problems why we haven't used the assisted reproduction technique yet as much as we would love to. But uh, it is important to research into these techniques right now since we still have a number of animals available where we can do the research on and where we can collect, for example, sperm and oocyte and embryos and actually preserve them because we are now seeing a, a large uh, wave of extinction or a large wave of declining of many big species. So it is uh, really urgently necessary to go deeper into the assisted reproduction techniques and to, to use the possibilities we have to promote um, populations to grow. This the technique uh, uh, has mainly been studied in mammals, but there are uh, certain groups that work on different um, uh, members like uh, the birds, the reptiles, and even in, in amphibians has been very little done, but it, is, it, it has started um, because um, the assisted reproduction techniques can only be successfully applied if we know a lot of the reproduction physiology. And this is why we first need to understand each individual and how they work, how their reproduction works basically, and then we can implement the techniques. Um, and uh, there is little been done, but uh, for example, uh, here again in the domestic animals, it's quite interesting for poultry, for example, there's lots of artificial insemination in our poultry, so we can use the techniques that have been developed for domestic animals and uh, transfer it in some instances to their wild or endangered counterparts. And um, there have been also some uh, um, experiences with crocodile insemination, for example, and um, very little has been done in, in amphibians, um, but I think this will be actually the next step. But of course it depends on the, on the money again, <laughs> and uh, people are more willing to spend money on the sexy species, the big mammals, compared to a frog or 
any other amphibian. So it's again a, a commercial interest that drives the advances. There is no real official network, unfortunately. We are working on it to offer zoos the opportunity if they have something really valuable that is, has not reproduced maybe, that is not genetically represented, that we um, still harvest the sperm post-mortem of these animals. Um, there is in Germany, it's the Leibniz Institute of Zoo and Wildlife Research that offers this specifically for feline species. So whenever there is a, um, a danger leopard or um, some other cat species um, that died, they will actually have the zoo to send them the gonads to Berlin to process them. And so they, they are able to harvest all size and sperm already and they also produce embryos then in the laboratory, which are then frozen and then, then they are stored for the future, which is actually a very good project. Um, but the, it's, not, it's not commonly done for all the species and I think we need to work on this. Yeah. The, uh, the rhino um, is, uh, well, it's quite an interesting family. So we have um, two um, species of African rhinos. And um, so this is the white rhino, <laughs> the white-lipped rhino sometimes called, and the black rhino. Um, these are two rhino species um, that can occur in the same habitat, but they are both highly specialized. So the white rhino is more a grazer. Um, and the, the, the black rhino is, is a browser, so their anatomy is adapted to their, actually to their nutrition. Um, they both have two distinct horns, um, whereas when we go to the Asian species, there are another three. So in total we have five distinct rhino species, and the other three are all occurring in, in Asia. The largest is the greater one-horned rhino, and by the name you can already tell it only has one distinct horn. It's uh, occurring uh, across India and some uh, countries of Southeast Asia. And um, then there is two smaller Asian rhinos, the Java rhino and the Sumatra rhino. And these are native to Indonesia and uh, some Sumatra rhinos also occurred in Malaysia, but there's only two left now in captivity in Malaysia. Um, so the rest is all living in Indonesia, so Sumatran rhino specifically on the Sumatran island but also on, on the um, Kalimantan, the um, Indonesian part of Borneo. And the Java rhino, as, it, as the name says, only occurs in Java. And these two, the latter two rhinos are quite uh, endangered, so there are estimates that of both the Java rhino and the Sumatra rhino, only 60 individuals are still left. Um, so that's quite dramatic um, for the Indian rhino, the estimates are about 3,000 animals and um, the largest populations are still occurring for the white rhino, which is between 18 to 20,000, depending on which numbers you read, and about 5,000 individuals for the black rhino. So um, the African species, I mean even 20,000, if you really think about it, it's not much for such a large animal, it's not a, it's not a big number. Um, but if we even go to Asia, where the pressure is even higher with the habitat loss, with 60 individuals, it's looking quite critical for these animals to go extinct. The, the minimum viable population number is always in discussion. Um, it really depends on the species. If we look at rhinos, um, you can maybe take the example from the past. In the 1900s, there was maybe only 20 of the white rhino left in South Africa. And today we are back to about 20,000, so um, it was possible with 20 individuals to regrow the entire population. So that shows you that we should not give up hope yet on the Asian rhinos as well, um, with these low numbers if we take action now. But it's, it's really critical at this point, because the generation interval in rhinos is quite long. Um, a rhino cow can have a calf every two and a half years about. Um, so if you then add it up to the reproductive lifespan, which is about it's about from six to eight years till about their mid twenties, early thirties maximum, then you can calculate that she can only have so many calves in her life, 
Um, and so it, it, is, it is actually critical to have a good number because the only other uh, reason for having higher uh, individual numbers for a population to survive is the genetic diversity which of course is going to be um, smaller the less individuals um, you have left in the end. And um, for other species there are different predictions always depends on so many factors. Um, if, you, if you look at climate change at the environment, um, natural catastrophes. If you take all these into account, uh, you will end up with different um, projections for minimal viable population numbers. I think the panda bear has been, um, there has been models established where they say it's at least we need 60 individuals. So it very much depends on, on the species. Um, yeah, well, this is a very exciting addition to the work I'm doing at the moment um, because beside the applied assisted reproduction to help animals to have babies by actually um, yeah, using those new technologies, um, we also want to conserve genetics that we have available now for the future. And that means um, the big plan is now in Africa to go out and collect sperm or even post-mortem, uh, that means after an animal died, collect um, tissue and sperm and to put these into a cryobank. Um, so the idea here is that um, in the case of the horrible poaching that is going on now in South Africa, we can still up to 24 hours collect, um, or 48 hours depending on the climate outside of course, can collect viable sperm and freeze these sperm and different from just blood or cells or tissues that we freeze, the sperm is actually something that we can directly apply in, uh, in, in breeding programs. And so these genetics are really viable to my mind because they can be utilized right away without further manipulation. And um, since we still have a large number of animals available now, it's wise actually to collect from a huge range of individual sperm or on the female side, oocytes, or even produce embryos in vitro. Because if we um, put these things into a bank and we store them, um, the, the, the storage in liquid nitrogen is possible indefinitely. We still have the opportunity one day, if population is declining further, that we can go back and take these genetics out and actually apply them for breeding programs. So if we freeze them now, at least they won't be lost and they, won't be they will be applicable in the future. The connection with the Hammersburg Rhino Force now is that actually um, they, have, they are the first that have access to a carcass. They do the full necropsy to find the projectile, for example, um, with the gunshots involved in the poaching. And um, this would actually give the perfect opportunity to, to collect at the same time the reproductive tract. So that means the testicles and the males and the ovaries in the females. Um, that can be done by a trained person that is that is firm in the necropsy, is doing the necropsy anyway. They will just take it out and put it in a cooler box basically to cool it and to protect it from the sun and, and, the, and the heat. And um, these are then transferred to a laboratory where we can then process them. And that means um, that from the um, testicles or the, uh, more specifically the epididymis or the ovaries we can extract the gametes, the oocytes of the sperm, and they will then be processed and, and, and stored. And so the uh, idea came from Hammersbach Rhino Force because they, I mean, deal on a day-to-day -day basis sometimes even uh, with those rhino carcasses. And if nobody is taking any samples or processing that, um, then these animals will just be lost. They will just be uh, left out in the sun and vultures will take their part and that's it. So it would be actually um, an ideal opportunity um, to make some sense out of the senseless killing and try to save what we still can save. So. Well, the time is, is a very crucial factor. Usually the animals are shot at night um, or very early morning and um, it depends very much on the climate. In the winter it's quite cool in South Africa, so we think up to 48 hours the, if the testicles are um, still intact um, in the animal uh, we can harvest uh, viable sperm cells. 
So that gives us a good time spent. Of course, the faster we get to it, the better will be the results. I mean, it, it's a natural system and we can only play with it so much. Um, but uh, there is reports on viable um, sperm cells after two days. Though. So that, that, that is a good time span. Um, it's a bit more critical for the female side because the, the testicles are outside <laughs> under the skin whereas the ovaries are within the abdominal cavity and of course post-mortem um, everything heats up because the bacteria will grow and everything will start to warm up inside and then it gets, the temperature is quite critical for the egg cells to survive basically and then uh, we must act a bit quicker so ideally within six hours um, but there's reports up to 20 hours that it's possible to still harvest viable um, oocytes from the ovary and so it, it, it very much depends on how fast the carcass is found but then also the, it's a crime scene so the police have to clear um, the carcass so that they can do the post-mortem and access it and this is also of course a critical factor in Africa. Yeah, once we once we have the gonads, the, so the testicles and the ovaries in the laboratory, um, there is a process involved. Um, so the, the sperm will be flushed out the epididymis and uh, we use special solutions um, to keep the sperm happy basically. It's like a nutritional fluid that they will be transferred to and if necessary there will be several washing steps involved too if there is blood or any other uh, dirt or debris that we need to um, get uh, rid of and um, then the sperm will be cooled down in the fridge so from the ambient temperature it will be slowly cooled down over two hours in the fridge to about five degrees and only then it will be filled in special straws or vials for the cryopreservation process and that is again involving liquid nitrogen and um, so that the, the, the straws or the pellets we use will be um, uh, frozen further down over liquid nitrogen vapor and then they will finally be transferred in the liquid phase of the liquid nitrogen and um, we have to use liquid nitrogen, you can't just do it in a regular freezer because the temperature of liquid nitrogen is almost minus 200 degrees um, so this is the temperature we can store the, the sperm indefinitely in. So at least for uh, decades um, the sperm can be um, kept in this liquid nitrogen and will be still viable after thawing it. So we, when we saw it, we take it out and we bring it back to very quickly to the temperature of 37 degree of the body temperature again. Um, and then the sperm will move again. We always try to keep our um, equipment and all the processes field friendly and cost effective. So this is our credo basically. So we have to um, look always at these side, but not all things can be simplified as much. But the beauty about the liquid nitrogen is you are independent of electricity. So as long as somebody is just refilling the liquid nitrogen on a regular base, um, we are independent of this. So it's more about the monitoring and the regular refilling of that. Uh, nitrogen. Um, the equipment that we use is very often self-made or um, it's self-invented basically 